Welcome to episode number 94 of the LSR Podcast. My name is Matt Bryan, joined each and every week by the brightest minds in all of the gaming industry. With me, I have Dustin Galker making his triumphant return here to the podcast. I uh, have Adam Candy. That is the 2E No Y version, Adam Candy. Of course, you should follow both of these guys on the Twitter machine. At Adam Candy, that is two E's, no Y. At Dustin Galker, you are going to get so many hot takes, you will wonder why you were not following him before. And if you hate yourself, you can follow me at Matt Brown M2. Of course, we will talk numbers like we do with all of the states. We'll talk about DK Investor Day. We'll take a look at DC, what's going on there. And Interlight, we have some more news from those guys. Barstool making a debut pretty soon. And of course, our weekly update on New York, because we always have to touch on what's going on in New York. But let's kick things off here. With a rather interesting story coming out of Illinois, Dustin, I know you were uh, you were you were you were having some fun with this on the uh, on the Twitter machine. I think a lot of people were as well. Yeah, somebody's suing FanDuel for (laughs) uh, what what looks to be pretty ridiculous reasons. Right. was trying to bet on uh, in game on a college basketball game and uh, has claimed in, in a lawsuit in in Illinois and just in U.S. District Court in Illinois saying that the that Fanduel is intentionally trying to mislead the lead customers by not having up to date scores uh, on their live betting product again for for a basically a single NCA game New Orleans versus Incarnate Word uh, <laughs> and the, the whole the whole part of this is like and. So yes, the the it looks. I mean, he they provide the in the suit. You can see it. It looks like the the data was wrong or behind based on live betting. But you can even go in terms and conditions of everybody's live betting products, uh, and they they don't they don't uh, ascribe to saying this is going to be the most up to date information. And that you know, if you want to make sure that you're betting on it correctly, make sure you're looking at like the at the real live game, not what's going on on there. Uh, and the whole, so they, so the person alleges that Fandle's doing this on purpose when we all know that this is really just a, a problem of latency of data and that this is, and that the, the data in, and God only knows for lower level college basketball games, this data may not be the greatest thing in the world. So, um, you know, I, you know, I, I am all, he, for, all for holding sports books uh, accountable for what they do, but you yes. can't, you can't have live betting products if you expect their their score on the app to be right every single time. Now, if this was a constant problem, if every single score was wrong all the time, sure. But we got one example of this. I have not seen other examples of this, and it does seem like a pretty spurious lawsuit. Uh, and yeah, people are if you're taking that t- Fanduel to task for this, I mean, you basically got to shut down sports betting in the U.S. if this is the standard that you need to be held to in in offering live betting odds. Yeah, I mean, Adam, look, you and I lament the the live betting experience sometimes and whatnot. But again, we understand what's going on here. And, uh, you know, as much as I rag on it, I understand there's a lot at work that is happening to make this thing get shot to my phone and for me to be able to try to place an in-game wager. And so you, you take a look at this, and as Dustin basically said, it's like, okay, if if this is something that we are going to – uh, you know, go after FanDuel about you might as well just shut down in-game betting. It's a, there, there's just no there's no way in the world this isn't going to happen again. There's no way that there's any way that they can assure us that it's not going to happen again. And so if if this is something that is going to be the, a, a massive deal, then shut all the in-game down because it's uh, it's going to be a problem moving forward. And Matt, the screenshots that the lawsuit shows are really kind of laughable when you see the fact that the primary argument made is that one live betting screen showed there were eight minutes remaining in the game, and another live betting screen showed there were six minutes remaining in the game. Come on now. Like, if that's really the problem, and if some court were to say that is a serious problem and FanDuel needs to fix it, then this $10 billion valuation we saw on Sport Radar might as well be $500 billion because to get that level of accuracy in data would be unbelievable. The other piece of the equation here is Dustin referenced the terms and conditions. We have no idea if this guy actually has gone through the entire process of trying to get a remedy through FanDuel. Like, he's going into the courts when, more than likely, this is going to be something that they say, uh, yeah, check the terms and conditions that you agreed to in the first place. There's no way that we need to be intervening in this. Now, as Dustin, as you mentioned, and this is something that I think anyone that's a longtime listener of this podcast certainly knows about the three of us. When sportsbooks do wrong, 
We were like, hey, you need to fix that. Hey, you need to get this right. We are not ones to sit here and just let people skate on things. If anything, we might be a little bit too harsh when it comes to things like that. But again, we we have to take every single one of these instances and we have to seriously just weigh them out and understand what goes on throughout the course of the process and how this all comes about. And, you know, as, as every, as both of you guys have mentioned here, I mean, this, this is, this is such a nothing burger. This is I, I, I can't even, I can't even really get out the words here where, you know, I can't even get to a point where I go, but you know, FanDuel, yada, 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 yada. It's like, you know, look, I, I get, I understand how the sausage is made. Maybe people, some people don't understand how the sausage is made here, but this is just a very, 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 very small thing. And uh, the fact that this is, you know, getting headlines and getting clicks and stuff just is, is kind of silly. Yeah. I mean, this lawsuit is a fishing expedition. I think we can mm-hmm. pretty obviously see they put, they, they got one client to say, Oh, here's what happened. Oh, we're looking for other clients so that we can, mm-hmm. so we can go to FanDuel. Maybe we get a settlement and, and you know, we get a little bit of money out of this. That's what it looks like to, to all of us, I think. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, again, we, we can't, we can't stress this enough. This is one example of bad data out of what, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of games yeah. that, that FanDuel is taking bets on every uh every and that's year, not right? hyperbole so, i mean they they yeah, have yeah. live odds for like every sport for everything every night so i right. mean like that's that's not even hyperbole when you say hundreds of thousands yeah i mean they're, yeah they're ta- t- table tennis matches there's we know mm-hmm. there's thousands of those right so yeah this is yeah i mean the i guess the danger is who knows how a court looks at this maybe a court looks at this and said yeah you're right this you got a raw deal here and maybe like if that's the standard though that you're being held to like there's there's some worrisome stuff it's worrisome right so i mm-hmm. i mean we, we look at it and say this is dumb but who knows what a court says when and we hope we hope they they see the they they understand this is not something that they should be held to but you know uh, so we hope we do hope for the clear clear heads will prevail and that we won't see any action out of this or we uh, that we see other people trying to sue sports books for this because that if this is the standard yes this i, I don't think i don't think this is hyperbole either that would be the death of sports betting in the united states because yeah. you can't you just can't do betting w- without having a little bit of inaccuracy baked in like this Adam, what if we could sue the sports books every time we got the spinning wheel of death? What would what, I mean? Like we would just we'd have we'd have a hundred lawsuits currently in play right now, just between you and I. I can't even imagine. I'll tell you what, though, the spinning wheel of death actually did save me from a horrible bet at halftime uh, last Saturday. So I'm wondering if those six different times that I clicked it and it rejected the bet, maybe it was the sports book having a little conscience and saying, you know what? Maybe not. <laughs> the spinning wheel of death, man, that thing. I'll tell you what. It's a love-hate relationship. It really is. Uh, Dustin, one of the things that uh, happened this week that was getting a lot of buzz and actually not only buzz with an, our little circle, but just buzz in the, even the financial world as well, was DraftKings Investor Day. And with all that, we want to hear what they had to say. And I certainly want to get y'all's opinion on whether you agree with what they had to say. I need our producer to put like a little buy DKNG right here, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's all this was, was uh, uh, DraftKings, you know, it's an investor day. It's meant to set to, you know, to tell all the good things that's going that are going mm-hmm. on at DraftKings, basically, right? Uh, a couple top level things that stood out, uh, they're predicting $1.7 billion in EBITDA uh, on five, on $5.4 billion in revenue uh, over, you know, this is long-term. This is not next year or this year. This is what they're projecting long-term. And so that's what you're, when you're seeing the stock and people's trading it, they're, they're looking at the long-term of what's, of what DraftKings position. And so that's what they said they're, 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 they're worth. Um, and the other part is that, you know, DraftKings was pretty frank about uh, the offshore market. And this is fascinating. And I, you know, this is what I've, you know, thought to be true anecdotally in hearing from people is that there's, they're not really converting offshore betters that they're often, finding new this these are betters who are not betting online a ton and uh, you know this conversion from the offshore market has not happened in any great way that the, that that the, there's a stickiness to offshore betting uh, and to the, to existing platforms that that uh, that the operators and draftkings are coming up against and you know that's you know this that's part of why i think people are still bullish too and especially the operators themselves they they're only tapping into new and and you may be very casual betters if you can start converting those people at offshore sites that's a that's a that's a massive market that's still relatively untouched and i maintain that they're doing pretty well in all of this because of the confusion around sports betting in the u.s that people think quote unquote is just legal now since the supreme court decision and and it's and that is not the case but you you go search on 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 the google machine and you find offshore sports books right so 
Um, there's definitely interesting stuff. A lot more details in this in the story over there by Matt Waters on what what DraftKings would said, but uh, their tr- their stock has been trading pretty well. I haven't looked today, but it was near seventy dollars, I think, yesterday. So. Yes, uh, if we want to go back exactly one month, this uh, the uh, DraftKings stock was trading at sixty dollars and ninety four cents. Fast forward to as we are sitting here right now, recording this, Adam seventy one dollars and seventeen cents. If you look at the uh, if you look at the all time high, seventy two dollars and sixteen cents. So you can see we are only trading about a dollar off of the all time high that was actually hit yesterday for for the stock. So I mean, listen. We do talk a ton about the expansion of sports betting, and we talk a ton about, you know, the, the what we think still. We're very bullish, obviously, on this market and stuff. But, I mean, look, there, I do at least understand why investors are getting in now, why they are trying to get a hold of this stuff, and why they want to hold on to it. Because, again, we keep talking about this. But New York is still not is still not out there. Texas is still not out there. Florida is still not out there. We are talking about the vast majority of the population of this country that is still, you know, without sports betting and stuff. So, I mean, the upside for these companies and if DraftKings and FanDuel continue to whatever market they enter, stay in kind of that top one, two, three at the very least spot, I I guess I kind of get it. I mean, again, I'm not stock guy, but I'm sure there's a lot of people who say, look, I'm going to buy this now because they're eventually going to be in New York. It's eventually going to be in California. It's eventually going to be in Florida. It might not be this year, next year, the year after that, but it will be one day. Matt, the important thing to keep in mind is that just like when you go on an earnings call and there's that warning about forward-looking statements, we are not stock advisors. We are only stonk advisors. Uh, We we advise on all legal stonks, uh, stocks that is someone else's game. Uh, Yeah, I understand what you're saying when it comes to DraftKings. I thought the other thing that was interesting in that report that seemed to be targeted at what you just said, the the idea of a rocket ship that never stops going north, was when Jason Robbins, the CEO, said that he believes that after five years in a particular market, that promotional spend grinds to almost zero. Um, That will be interesting to see because when we look at the pace that DraftKings and FanDuel are on right now, they are on pace to spend the better part of a billion dollars per year in promo and marketing costs. Now, I think it's important to separate out and say promo spending, as in bonusing every customer five thousand, five hundred, or a thousand dollars when they come in, is not the same as spending on TV ads or doing what FanDuel did today and bringing in Kenny Smith, uh, you know, as an ambassador. But that concern in terms of bringing customers and then keeping customers is going to be very interesting to see if Jason Robbins' theory on that ultimately plays out because the stickiness that we talked about with customers certainly has been apparent thus far, but will it keep up over time? Will any of the big Euro or UK operators make a later push into the US market and then a DraftKings, a FanDuel or someone else has to really fight to keep its customers? So it'll be really interesting to see how that ultimately shapes up because I think that statement that he made goes a long way to whether or not you believe the long-term path to profitability for DraftKings. And Dustin, I did see something come through yesterday when it did hit that all-time high uh, that Jason Robbins joined the Three Comma Club. He is, his his stock uh, in the company is worth over a billion dollars at this point. So, uh, they're doing, you know, listen, it's, uh, it's it's just, it is just, we keep saying this all the time every time these things happen, but it's it's just so crazy that they were... (laughs) They were like so close to just going out of business. They were trying to merge with FanDuel because neither neither company was going to be able to survive. And then here they are, like both just dominating, you know, nearly every market they get into. Yeah, I mean, for for uh, for me, who's been covering DraftKings and Jason Robbins for quite a while, it is <laughs> wild to see that he's he's gotten to this level because yes, it there are times in the past when this has been <laughs> on a, on a knife edge, right? Like uh, again, we we've referenced that New York DFS law back in uh, 2016 all the time but that that was like that was that would have been game over for Jeff Kings right there and then yes uh, they tried to merge that didn't happen it's like uh, yeah it's a, the the cards have fallen correctly for for Mr. Robbins for sure and you know he's built he's built something you know, uh, obviously it's hard to quibble with what he's built here mm-hmm. now it's he's you know he's built a built a sports betting machine that is doing well uh, yes, they're spending lots of money to do that, but uh, you know uh, there are people who are betting against him, and I was probably one of those people betting against him succeeding long term. And you know he he has succeeded to this point. Absolutely. 
Uh, Adam, let's uh, let's take a look at another company that, uh, you know, people are not betting against. I actually just because I just since I have everything pulled up here, I see that <laughs> I see that the Penn National stock is up another six percent today to up to one hundred and thirty dollars a share. Um, let's talk about Barstool. Uh, if you insist, uh, they are now <laughs> launching their app in Illinois. So add a third market for the Barstool Sportsbook app, which is pretty well on pace with what uh, Jay Stone, the CEO of Penn National, said would be the rollout pace this year for Barstool after they focused just on Pennsylvania last year. So in Illinois now, in time for March Madness, we see that this Illinois market has been absolutely surging. Uh, in January, nearly $600 million in handle, about an 8.3, 8.4% hold. So uh, pretty decent for the operators there. And now uh, Barstool and what it says is its built-in customer base that it can convert over to sports betting without having to pay hundreds of dollars per customer arrives in Illinois. It's pretty crazy to think about just how much of Penn National's fortunes ride on Barstool at this point and to see Penn National essentially go all in. Uh, Jason Noden said on the most recent earnings call that, you know, criticism of Dave Portnoy, the founder of Barstool, is essentially just from people who don't like them. Uh, and that to, that is repeating the Barstool line uh, 100%. So it seems the Penn National is all in on Barstool and Barstool app continues to make its march across the U.S. I mean, and while we're while we're talking about Illinois, and I know we'd probably get to this a little bit later, but we're already talking about Illinois, so we might as well hit it. I mean, the the numbers coming out of of Illinois are just absolutely massive. I mean, this was one of the things we expected, right? I mean, when we were leading up to the launch there in Illinois, we were saying, hey, one, not only gigantic state, but uh, you know, pretty good, pretty good sports state as well when it comes to everything. And now we're just seeing just uh, you know massive numbers in a market that's not even close to maturity yet. Uh, you know, we're we keep predicting which state's going to be the biggest state, who's going to have the the most handle here, like pretty soon. And you know, if you, again, if you kind of read the tea leaves, Illinois seems to be the leader and you know leader in the clubhouse here. I'll take it. Illinois is yes, very big. Five hundred eighty million dollars in handle mm -hmm. for the last month. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the biggest state with legal online sports betting, right, by population. So this is this is not perhaps not shocking, but it's you know it's it's happened very quickly. There's a much slower burn in some of these other states, and Illinois again turned on that uh, switch with. Uh, with uh, going from in-person registration, remote registration, and then the lid was blown off it, right? So we we've seen that all the the, the major operators are there now. Barstool as well. That will that will probably be additive to the to the mm -hmm. the bottom line and the handle in Illinois. So yes, this is. I don't know if we can predict that Illinois is going to surpass New Jersey. New Jersey has a lot of good stuff working for it, as we know. New York access to the New York market, as long as they're dawdling on on legalizing online betting, in addition to the head, the tailwinds of online casino and, and poker and cross sell from there. So uh, you know it could be. We could be looking at a scenario, though, where it's Illinois and New Jersey for the biggest sports betting market in the not too distant future. And Adam, Dustin kind of alluded to something I was going to follow up with you. I mean, it's we see this massive number coming out of Illinois and then you see Barstool getting added to the fold. And, you know, we we were talking about guys tend to, you know, tend to be sticky and things like that as far as that goes. But, you know, at least anecdotally. We think that you know, Barstool is actually just kind of a different crowd, right? I mean, we kind of think that that's kind of a, a different subset of the people that might be at DraftKings or FanDuel or BetMGM or something like that. So, so it, it actually does lend to thinking that that is additive to this market there in Illinois as opposed to like, oh, they're going to be getting another account. And there will be some people who do that, of course. But the, the typical Barstool consumer, we at least think anecdotally, we haven't gotten the hard, hard evidence yet, but I, you know, it seems to be, it's a different consumer than, than what is going on with some of these other books. So you know, where this number is in a few months now, once Barstool kind of gets going there, it, it, could be, it could be pretty substantial. There's no question about it, Matt. And that really is the story that Barstool is telling as well. They're saying, you know, we have customers who are loyal to us and only mm -hmm. us. That will be put to the test because this Illinois market has had a chance to mature a little bit over the past few months. As you said, it is not at maturity by any stretch, but there has been a chance for the big boys to come in there and develop some level of loyalty with their customers. And so there could be some crossover with Barstool's mm -hmm. potential base. We'll see. Uh, we'll get an opportunity to see that starting today, in fact, uh, with that app going live here on Thursday. But to the point that you were making a moment ago, 
Jason Robbins also said at that DraftKings Investor Day that if we're just talking about online sports betting alone, that Illinois is already their largest state. Uh, that's it's already surpassed uh, New Jersey because a lot of what they have in New Jersey uh, goes back to their casino offerings as well and the cross sell that goes along with that. So that's how quickly Illinois has been able to pull this off. And we only saw at the uh, you know the very beginning of the pandemic that Governor Pritzker suspended the in-person registration requirement, and there seems to be no uh, end in sight to the monthly uh, renewals of that suspension that Pritzker has put out there. Dustin, uh, let's talk about the the District of Columbia and and you know I know that every time we talk about the District of Columbia, we always have it seems like we're we're just kind of bringing some doom and gloom to the podcast, and I'm afraid that we're doing that yet again here. I don't know if it's doom and gloom. I find it uh, like pretty hilarious, actually. The whole thing. It's just the whole th- the whole thing is a mess. It's it's such a mess that it's it's funny. I think it's not <laughs> funny in that this is supposed to create revenue for Washington D.C. and it is not doing that at all. Uh, I'll just read I'll just read the sentence because this is this is a mind boggling sentence to read. Uh, Gambit D.C. was forecast to bring in 9.6 million uh, to the D.C. lottery in fiscal 2020, which ended September 30th. Gambit, of course, the only sports betting app that's w- uh, available nation uh, district wide in, in in D.C. So, in reality, though, there was just 352 thousand dollars transferred, according to the agency fiscal <laughs> officer Craig Lindsay. Now, that that's that's a that's a little little under what they projected. I'd say it's uh, you know you're go- you're talking almost 10 million dollars, and you've only got <laughs> several hundred thousand, and that's on top of the fact this is actually. Uh. Cost- and that's just the raw re- raw numbers. This is actually costing the district money right now because of expenses versus that versus revenue. And it's uh, I don't think there's any uh, at this point. I don't think there's any worse rollout of online sports betting in the United States. It would be hard. I don't I, I can't think of what anything that's been worse. There have been problems in multiple states, but nothing has been nearly as bad as this. And this is all all goes to the monopoly that D.C. set up with Interlot, which has been uh, by all accounts a miserable failure over the past over the past year. Adam, would you like to pile on? <laughs> Just such a, it's a harsh term. I don't know that it's necessarily <laughs> piling on. I do have some things to add. Uh, yes. if, if that would, yes. uh, if that would, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, William Hill has had a retail sports betting presence for a little less than a year at uh, Capital One Arena. That has beaten the snot out of that app. Uh, consistently that during a pandemic people are still more willing to go down and bet in person at the ticket office at the arena and the lottery had the chutzpah to come into the meeting they had on this this week and say that they found that some people really just prefer the retail sports betting experience got it they prefer the experience Mm. of walking up to a ticket office and betting on sports as opposed to betting on their phones like the 95% of people in Pennsylvania, the 90% of people in New Jersey who are choosing to do this on their apps. I mean, some of the reasoning that was given for why this has not worked out at that meeting was laughable. And one of the council members of the district council essentially responded to the lottery saying, well, listen, it's still going to be better because we're going to return 50% of the revenue to you by coming back and saying, that's great, but it seems like in other places there are, you know, 20%, there's 20% being returned of actual revenue. Like 50% right. of zero is zero. Mm-hmm. Last time I checked anyway. I mean, that's typically what I, what I get. Um, but, uh, but we're going to have to deal with this in Ohio? So apparently uh, there is at least some input from Intralot, the same company that is behind the DC lottery mess uh, in Ohio. Now, Keep in mind, this is just testimony from the most recent select committee hearing in Ohio, which happened this week. Uh, We are in year two of what has felt like a 10-year process for these bills in Ohio, but we continue to make steady progress towards something happening. Interlot gave some testimony there in which they said that uh, they think Ohio should go to a 40% tax rate on sports betting and that we've essentially seen that the state-run model is by far clearly by the results thus far, the best model for sports betting in the U.S. And 
it was just like someone had appeared from an alternate reality in front of a microphone somewhere in Ohio to speak to the legislators and give them the intralot opinion on things. And much the same way that we talked about the Golden Knights and the tout service and it being the one thing that can unite yeah. everyone in the sports betting industry, the other thing that can unite everyone in the legal That's U.S. True. sports betting industry is that intralot is off its rocker. This is true. This is true. I, I, I should, yes, we, we, should also, we should also mention that. Uh, Dustin, so we have talked a ton, every, basically every single podcast we have to talk about New York. It is the one that's kind of hanging out there that does have a possibility, so we keep up doing updates. And we, you know, along the way, talked about how Governor Cuomo over there had said that, you know, uh, he didn't agree with the, the open model, you know, having a bunch of different books come in. He wanted to make sure that it was small and keep things run by the state, yada, 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 in the lottery, blah, blah, blah. And we were saying, okay, this guy obviously is misinformed. Obviously, this guy doesn't really get the whole thing here. Maybe he's playing the long game. Maybe he's playing some sort of political game. Well, he might not be playing political games that much longer. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to talk about New York sports betting now without talking about the fate of Governor Andrew Cuomo, whose, whose stock has fallen uh, dramatically in recent re weeks and months over uh, two, two series of allegations. Uh, the nursing home death cover-ups that were the first one where the state was underreporting how many people were dying in nursing homes. Uh, uh, Cuomo has been obviously viewed as a leader on the pandemic and how his state has handled it. And these numbers and how, how they've been treated has not been taken well. And it's been it's been that's been a mess and then of course there's uh you know the the new accusations that are coming out almost daily now about uh you know potential mm -hmm. out alleged sexual harassment or uh or or other things involving women and in, in mm -hmm. governor cuomo and it's been you know we just had one today that seems to be the most serious uh, of all of them and it's actually been reported to police uh now and it's it's becoming increasingly difficult to see how he's going to survive or or if he does how much political power he's going to continue Continue to wield. So how how does that all intersect with sports mm -hmm. betting? Not exactly sure, but you know he he was pushing his model and he has a lot of power and he had lots of friends in in the legislature and other Democrats and those Democrats have been slowly backing away from him and uh, there's there's some question of whether the legislature even needs him to do sports betting. Now, this is, a, again, sports betting is such a small thing. I can't, I can't reiterate this enough. Such a small thing in the, in the overall politics of what's going on in New York. But, you know, there's a, the, the, legislature, the, the legislators who have been pushing for sports betting might be emboldened to do something. That's, that's, the, you know, that's kind of the chatter on the street to, to continue pushing together through their legislat legislation that would allow for multiple skins and get it through this year. You know, there's also the part of uh, this is needed for the budget, although the, the COVID uh, relief package that President Biden just signed also has money for the state of New York and local government. So there's not there, there's maybe not as big of a need even to find incremental revenue in New York. So there's a lot going on. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I would I'm not sure if I'm a buyer or seller on it, whether this is good or bad for for sports betting products, prospects in New York. But it's clearly going to have an impact on what actually happens this year, if anything. Yeah, Adam, we, we take a look at this and, you know, whatever, you know, the the other stuff aside, right? Like, I mean, you know, love, hate, otherwise Cuomo and all the things that are going on. We're not going to get into all of that. We're not going to, you know, until the hard facts come out and, and things like that. But if we are going to look at this from what we do and from from a gambling aspect here, if you were if you were not loving what he was selling and you were pitching something completely, you know, if you were pitching something different and you thought that your thing was better, you have to be feeling better about your side over the last couple of weeks than you did a couple of weeks before that. Because again, the Q score has gone down uh, for, for Governor Cuomo over there. And again, with all of that, I mean, how combative does he really want to get if you guys, you know, kind of start going forward with your model? Does he really want to get super combative over something like this when he's dealing with all of this other stuff? So at the very least, you're probably feeling in a much, much better position today than you were a few weeks ago. Our Brad Allen talked to lobbyist Bill Pascrell, who's been involved in the situation in New York, and he essentially said that his read on the situation as of today is that he would bet on the legislation that's been proposed by Senator Adabo and Assemblyman Pretlow, which as of now would have two skins per operator, up to 14 total brands in New York. Um, 
really it has been only Cuomo who has been the impediment to mobile sports betting in New York for quite a while now. It's only even this year that he talked about that state run model, right? In the past, he basically said it's such a drop in the bucket that we're not going to deal with this and essentially said, sure, let people from New York keep going to New Jersey to place their wagers. Then he comes out with this model that he said is going to generate $500 million a year for the state of New York. And, you know, again, Brad Allen put those numbers to the test and they don't pencil out at all. Maybe in an ideal situation, you could get half of that. So if you remove the impediment of Cuomo's opposition, whether that is by weakened political force or whether that is by resignation, uh, however it goes down, it certainly seems that the open model plans have a better chance than they did. As you said, uh, one thing that I thought was notable was that one of the people who was backing away from Cuomo was the Speaker of the Assembly, Carl Hasty, who has been someone else who has been on Cuomo's side as someone standing in the way of legislation in the past. We've seen New York mobile legislation make it through the Senate fairly handily and then never even get a floor vote in the Assembly in New York. So, Uh, Look, reading the tea leaves on this would be next to impossible right now, but it's fair to say that New York bears watching on an almost daily basis. Dustin, one of the things I uh, I I wanted to add to the to the to the rundown here because we we mentioned it a while back whenever they acquired Bet Dot Works. But, you know, several other acquisitions since and, you know, Bally's Gaming, there's there's a great article up over at Legal Sports Report right now on this but this company uh obviously very deep pockets has gone in and started spending all over the place they acquire bet.works they acquire the naming rights for all of the what used to be the fox sports regionals they are now owned by Sinclair. but you know for if you're wondering which channels they were if you've ever seen fox sports west or fox sports you know carolinas where all the fox sports regionals they have the naming rights to those just very very soon those will be renamed bally's sports you know, insert region here. They go out, they acquire Monkey Knife Fight, they acquire Sport Color, which is a, a free-to-play game. And according to their uh, according to their COO, or, or company chairman, I should say, they're actually not even done spending here. So we talked about if you're going to come in and try to make a splash, really, you're going to have to do it through dollars. You're going to have to do it through spending. And it seems at least like right now, Bally Sports is willing to do that. Yeah, it's hard to, to think of anybody. Well, definitely, I mean, I don't think it exists in the U.S. The casino space to anybody who's transformed anything quite as quickly as this. They went from, yeah, not on the radar to buying everything on the map. And, you know, who, who knows exactly how they play into the U.S. sports betting ecosystem mm-hmm. here, what kind of market share they can get. But they're trying. I mean, this is, and, yeah. you know, again, we, we say this all the time. You either you got to spend somehow, right, to get if you're going to if you're going to be you want to be a player now, you have to spend. And then whether that's marketing dollars or whether that's, you know, basically trying to acquire, acquire every single company that you could need to possibly run a sports betting yeah. enterprise or an online gambling enterprise in the United States. That's what they're doing. Uh, you know, what what uh, Sue Kim, the, the the chairman you mentioned, said to, to our Brad Allen, realistically, we're not done. We're just getting started in, in parentheses there on M&A. We want to be a technology company. The purchases we made are not just for the technology, but for the people who build and run the technology. So, you know, they, they are, they, if they're not done, I, I'm, I'm going to believe them. They've already bought a lot of mm-hmm. stuff. You, you went through that laundry list already, and they're, you know, they could, you know, if they want to be seriously involved in online casino, they could be, uh, you know, buying an online casino platform. They're not in horse racing, uh, which, you know, has been something that's been at least interesting and growing a little bit uh, during the pandemic for uh, for moving people to online betting options. So, uh, you know, they also made an offer for Allied Esports Entertainment recently. So, yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do. They have they have uh, acquired a lot of things. They they say they're going to acquire more things, and and whether that leads to you know them being a meaningful player in in the market remains to be seen. But it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Adam. One of the things we've said is is you know we're never going to fault anyone for trying. Like like like, like we're if you want to go out and and give this thing a whirl, uh, look, we're all, more power to you. We think the more options in the market for the consumer is better as it is. And you know, look, if you want to look at at trying to circle everything here, I mean, so media deal check, which we know those are are few and far between at this point. 
a DFS site, so you have a big email list of people who are likely to be sports bettors when it moves into the various markets, into the various states. Check. They acquire Monkey Knife Fight. Free to play, so you get people who are at least gambling-minded or at least willing to play for free so they can possibly be converted to playing for real money. Check in, in getting that done as well. And then on top of that, I think you also have that's a little bit under the radar here too is this partnership that they have with Sinclair. Sinclair also, outside of the regional networks, also owns the Tennis Channel. So, like, that's a, a niche sport that maybe a lot of, you know, DraftKings and FanDuel and stuff hasn't really focused on. So, maybe they could come in and, and try to be, you know, the tennis betting company and things. So, look, at the end of the day, they're, they're going about it, at least in my opinion, the right way in, okay, we've got deep pockets. We're going to go. We're going to spend. We're going to get the media deal. We're going to acquire the DFS company. We're going to acquire the free-to-play company. We've got some niche offerings that we might be able to do that nobody else cares about spending time on uh, whether it works out or not we can't say but I think it's a pretty good base at least for for getting things going you lay out the case there and you check all the boxes right in terms of if you were going to start from the ground right now what would you do in terms of trying to reach a market in U.S. sports betting and I think it brings up a number of questions that we could probably have another whole podcast talking mm. about this but what is the total addressable market in the U.S., right? Like, how big is this ultimately going to be? Because we don't know right now if Bally's is fighting for a set share or we don't know if they have the ability to expand the market into, like you just said, whether it's the niche with tennis, whether they can make a dent in esports, whether they can convert yeah. those DFS players, whatever it happens to be. That ultimately is the question for any of these companies that are going to try to make a real impact right now. The other thing is, if you look at sports overall, and I think it's very interesting to see Sue Kim talk about it as a technology company, if you have money to invest in this space right now, where else is it going? Like, where else would you take money in the sports space and put it other than into sports betting? Because yeah. the opportunity crosses over so many different ways, right? Think of this regional sports network deal that they have here viewership for TV sports outside of the pandemic has been declining for a very long time. It's an aging population. They're moving to streaming. Uh, they don't want to consume a three or four hour baseball game in its entirety. What do people believe can change that? Well, if you can make some sort of a fragment of the game into a betting opportunity, betting on an inning, betting on a pitch, whatever the yeah. case might be, then that's where you might be able to bring consumers, especially younger consumers, back in. So I understand right now if Bally Bets or whoever it is wants to try to execute this playbook, and you're right, they've gone about it the right way thus far. It's just impossible to say at this moment what sort of a market they're trying to fight for. And, and Dustin, to put a kind of a, a bow on this with all of that, I think Adam did touch on a – on a pretty uh, on a pretty important thing actually with the whole Bally's situation here and you know they're 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 yet to launch so we don't have like a, a lot of evidence and tangible stuff that we can really pull from here but all these regional networks the reason they exist is because they have rights to to games with these professional sports teams so whether that is you know, a show leading right into the game itself to drive people to bet, or like Adam even said, maybe there's little pop-up things inside the games that you know that that they get going or something. It, it is it is certainly it is certainly something that nobody else has currently. I mean, yes, William Hill has a deal with ESPN, but they just talk about that mainly on Daily Wager and you know the odds and this that, and the other. It's not necessarily a a show focused, you know, that could be focused literally on the hometown team or, you know, whatever it might be like leading into a game. So it, it, it is at least a fairly interesting prospect uh, to see what they do come, you know, the fall. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no, none of these media deals are as, as targeted and as relevant, I think, as the, as this is for Bally's. And they, I mean, they, and they can deploy this basically as they want. They're not dependent on like a, like a media deal, right? They, they now own the stations, right? So they, there's, it's very interesting to see how, to see how that works and how it deploys. But yes, they are, I mean, these, these regional networks are in places with, with either have online sports betting already or, or may in the future. And, you know, they're, they're in some big markets that don't have it yet. So I don't think anybody has quite the, the same leverage there as, as they do with this. So it'll be, it is, I think it is an advantage that they, that they have with with owning this part mm -hmm. of the, the the ecosystem and the media deal that they have, rather than depending on how it how it works and like and, and being less targeted and being more with a national kind of brand or piecemeal on different uh, you know different places. I mean, points bet with NBC and their regional networks are arguably a little different, but 
anyway, yes, uh, you know, that, that's the part that's the perhaps the most interesting from the Bally's standpoint. And it's it'll still be it's still weird to think of it as Bally's regional. The uh, Bally's is actually on the name, uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's but it's but it's there and it's coming, and you're gonna see you're gonna see that and see how they leverage it moving forward. And I think an interesting point to add to what you guys were just talking about, and Dustin just actually uh, touched on it, was that PointsBet NBC deal. I've been seeing more integration recently mm. with PointsBet and NBC, especially in the NHL broadcasts that I've been watching. And I don't really like the way that it's been done. Uh, it, it's being done where they throw it in front of the play-by-play announcer uh, to say, like, between periods, here's the odds for coming. what's coming and up in the game. they don't know what they're talking about, right? And they and have like, no they idea. Right, and, right. And, but the problem is they add that attitude to it. They add the like, oh, I don't know, here are the numbers. <laughs> what do you want to do with it? Right. Like, thank God Eddie Olchek was on the broadcast uh, last night when the play by play guy, Brendan Burke, just said to him, All right, Eddie, you want to explain to the people what these things mean? Uh, and then Eddie was there trying to explain a puck line to someone who's never heard it before. So um, I think there's definitely some room to improve when we talk about these integrations. Um, and Matt, I felt like it was probably important for me at this point in particular, since PointsBet NBC leaks into golf. Would you like 30 seconds to to talk to the world about golf betting offerings? <laughs> uh, oh, boy. I know. I rant. I, I do. I rant a lot, and, and it just is what it is. I mean, listen, Nevada, we talk about how it it's c- continues to slowly slip away as being the gambling capital of the, or sports betting capital of the world as it is anyway. And then, uh, then you go to the golf betting menu, and Dustin, boy, don't ever come here for a major. If you like, like, just stay in Oregon. You're gonna have much better offerings in Oregon than we have here. You can pull up, you can pull up every single book in town, and they won't even, they won't even have top twenty markets listed for all the golfers. I mean, it's, it is like, it's insanity. There are literally hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands, of ways that you can bet at DraftKings and FanDuel and PointsBet and BetMGM outside of Nevada, and you cannot make more than pretty much outright bets here. They'll put up a few head-to-heads the night before, Mm -hmm. and that's about all you can get. And so, uh, yeah, I know y'all are listening. Do something about it. Be better. Be better. (laughs) Put up some top 20 markets. Put up some top 10 markets. We can go from there. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate you teeing me up for that. No problem. The message here is be best. Yes, yes, yes. Be better. Uh, uh, so why don't you uh, give us some some state updates here? Happy to do so. Let's take the quick tour around the United States as we do here at the back of the podcast most weeks. Uh, starting in Connecticut, it's very strange to announce an agreement in Connecticut when there are three parties that you absolutely need and only two of them have actually agreed to the deal. But that's what happened uh, last week in Connecticut when Governor Ned Lamont uh, had a sports betting deal apparently just with the Mohegan tribe. Uh, and the Mashantucket Pequot have not had their concerns allayed just yet. And they put out a statement saying this is bad faith negotiation, essentially, essentially. So here we are in Connecticut where it felt like things were going the right direction. But once again, for the thousandth straight year in Connecticut, I have started to get my hopes up just a little bit. And then there's been what looks like a potentially major hiccup Uh, jumping in here. So not quite sure where things stand right now because there are greater compact negotiations that have to be worked out between the governor and the two main gaming tribes in that state. Stay tuned for what's going on in Connecticut. Uh, Down the coast, we go to Maryland where voters approved legal sports betting this past fall at the ballot box. It is up to legislators to get it done in terms of implementing it. And they took a big step toward that actually just today. Uh, The sports betting bill in Maryland passes the House here on Thursday morning. Uh, Fairly open model. Looks like they're going to try to get uh, double-digit mobile sports betting licenses and a number of retail licenses as well opened up there. So uh, miles to go before we sleep there to get it through the Senate and uh, on through the governor. But we do have the momentum there, at least in the right direction in Maryland. Georgia, boy, I don't really know what's happening in Georgia right now, which is a very good thing for the person at Legal Sports Report to say, Mm -hmm. I guess. But... um, It seemed like we were making fairly steady progress on a bill. Then it seems that we might be at a point where we have to go back to the ballot because there's been some confusion over whether sports betting can constitutionally be added to the lottery. Uh, Not the first state that, of course, has gone through this, but now a separate bill has made its way uh, into the legislature that would send it to the ballot that has passed the chamber. Uh, we We still have motion, we'll say, going on. Uh, down in Georgia that we're keeping an eye on. 
Uh, out in Arizona, of course, the bill's already passed one chamber. It has cleared another committee now. So uh, slow but steady in Arizona where we, where we had a weird thing where sports betting got amended into a historical horse racing bill. But it does seem that the momentum continues there in Arizona where the governor and the tribes are on the same page, despite the fact that some have tried to make it out to say that they're not on the same page. Uh, we shall see. Uh, Wyoming, uh, we have a bill introduced there, seeing what's happening there. No real motion on that. Kansas uh, continues to have sports betting on its radar. We told you about Ohio uh, a little bit earlier as well. Of course, for all of that information as to what's going on in terms of legal sports betting, we are tracking all of the hearings throughout the country at LegalSportsReport.com or at the Legal Sports Report Twitter account. You can also follow Brad uh, Allen and Matthew Waters and Pat Evans on Twitter for day-to-day -day happenings. Dustin, take us home with uh, some stuff, some shenanigans. We're gonna end. We're gonna end the podcast on some shenanigans that are going on over at the Google App Store. Uh, I mean, should we? I don't know if it's good. I should have been angry earlier in the call in the podcast. <laughs> that would have been a good idea, right? But oh, we'll, we'll save the anger for now. First, we'll get you up to date with what's going on. We, we we talked about this, I think, in a prior podcast. You read about it. But the Google Play Store just started opening up for legal gambling apps in the United States. We actually saw DraftKings uh, Sportsbook Casino just go get into the Google Play Store this past this week. So uh, they opened it up starting March first. Uh, we learned about it earlier this year. Uh, so that's that's where we start from this. So you know we have intrepid folks over here uh, who are just you know, like, oh, wait, what what else might be in the in the Play Store now that DraftKings is live? We started looking around, looking for other other brands, FanDuel and BetMGM. So here we go. We some some of our folks over at Play Michigan uh, intrepidly looked for. Uh, BetMGM and saw that there are somehow four BetMGM labeled apps in the in the Google Play Store, and none of them have anything to do with BetMGM. But they actually, at least two of them, actually take you to my bookie, which is an offshore website that is serving the United States illegally and is just trying to dupe people. So I have I have lots of questions about this. It's possible we've actually are we've actually already reached out to Google and haven't heard anything. But like w number one, why are, why is uh, an offshore store or anybody being allowed to infringe upon BetMGM's you know name and mark? Yeah, and their, first you know, and trying... foremost, right? Like, right. <laughs> like first and foremost, yeah, exactly. Right. Like this is this is this is yeah this is. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Google's just like, oh, they're uh, theoretically uh, uh, um, letting these or approving these things, right? And giving them some <laughs> right. kind of due diligence. Clearly no due diligence is being done at all because it's like, oh, BetMGM here. There's four of these. Go ahead. Uh, you're you're all clear to go, even though you have nothing to do with BetMGM, which is a, you know run by a massive multinational gambling company, casino and mm -hmm. hospitality country, uh, company. So there's that. And then there's the part of like, okay, th these were actually in the app store, in, in the Google Play Store before all of this too. Like just, just again, they look, they, they, they look on their surface. They don't say exactly what they do. They just say Ben MGM sports, but then you get into it and you like, you click on the app once you've downloaded it and it just takes you into the my bookie app. Like uh, you're just looking at my bookie odds and you can, you know, we haven't gone, we haven't obviously gone so far as to actually try to create accounts via this app. Who knows what, what's going on there, but it's all, it's like, what is Google doing if like this is even possible? And this makes you wonder what else is going on in Google Play Store if, if nonsense like this is going on. But yeah. you know, Google is you know a massive company, but like they are obviously failing pretty miserable at what's going on here related to one, you know, stopping copyright and trademark infringement and two, stopping illegal online gambling, which is at right as they're trying to go live with actual legal and regulated gambling apps. So story over at play Michigan, I think so a few of our other sites have also been, been running stuff about this, including, um, but it's, it's a fascinating story and I'll be, I'll be interested to see, you know, MGM has said they're trying to get this pulled out of the store, obviously because they don't want their trademark infringed right. upon or people thinking, Bet MGM is actually my bookie. Like it's all, it's it's just awful optics and awful in practice. So uh, you know, hopefully this all gets straightened out and Google gets its its, uh, its ship in order. Adam, are you like me? And maybe I'm just a horrible person. Are you at least mild? Would you at least be mildly impressed? If you found out that this is just some dude in his mom's basement who was like, you know what, I can submit a, an app and just have my affiliate account uh, like uh, attached to this app. And like he's just been getting all of these downloads like uh, off of the BetMGM thing because they just let him. Would you at least be just mildly, would you at least be mildly impressed that like somebody was, was able to figure that out? 
That right there, Matt Brown, is the American spirit. That is entrepreneurship <laughs> at its absolute finest if, uh, if that were happening. so and, and by the way, to all of our friends out there on sports betting Twitter who like to drag us uh, for being air quotes shills, uh, go get your mans out there. Go get them because the <laughs> offshores that you love to talk so good about, this is the kind of crap they're pulling. Yeah, again, I, I do want to know, if since there's multiple, I mean, certainly certainly one of those just has to be like some guy that like did it, like just attached his affiliate account to it, right? Like, I mean, wow, that is just... Yeah, uh, I, don't, I mean, that's the thing. We don't know exactly how this manifests because we're, we're probably yeah. not going to know. Maybe it's maybe it's actually my bookie. Maybe it is, like you said, somebody who's like just trying to track links to my bookie and, <laughs> and get paid that way. Maybe that's working. That's, that, that's, that's, that's feasible at least too. So who yeah. knows? But it's a, it's a mess crazy that is just absolutely crazy uh guys as uh, as adam mentioned all of the stuff that we talk here on the podcast head over and read the very good work being done by adam his team over at legal sports report.com if you want to follow adam on the twitter machine it is adam two e's on the candy instead of the y at adam i mean at dustin galker you can follow him on twitter and uh you can scroll back to the very beginning if you want to follow me on Twitter. I don't think you want to do that at all. Uh, please go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review wherever you uh, listen to your podcast. We do appreciate that. It helps us climb up the charts, and it lets us seem a little bit more relevant to the, to the algorithm and all that so more people can help find the podcast. So whether it be Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, wherever it is, go in, subscribe, rate, and review. We really do appreciate that as well. For Dustin, for Adam, I'm Matt. Talk to you guys next week.